Hi, I'm Judy Tayabji. Thanks very much for joining us today. I hope you had a great weekend, a chance to relax and enjoy the non-rain. There's even flowers coming up in Victoria now. Today we're looking at a subject that has to do with the military. And I don't know how many of you had a chance to hear what was going on when there was a public hearing process on the pay rates. But it's pretty shocking when you look at some of the living conditions. Now, ironically, it's at the same time that we're talking about possibly joining in some kind of action in the Middle East. In Canada, even though we see ourselves as a peacekeeping country, we still have a very active role that we play in international relations. I think it's more important that we get some of the background information on the living conditions of people in the military and try to understand how the government can, on the one hand, ask so much out of them when it comes to the ice storms in eastern Canada, and on the other hand, try to ignore some of them saying that they really need to have a little more respect accorded to them when it comes to their living conditions. I'm Judy Tayabji, and that's my opinion, and we'd like to hear yours, and we'll also be talking to three people who are on the inside of this. We'll take your calls to this number right now. And we have with us three guests. The first is actually someone you may have seen in the news or quoted in, uh, I guess, CBC. I heard you on uh, Philip Till's show, actually. Uh, retired Vice Admiral Chuck Thomas. And uh, thank you very much for having a chance to join us. It's a pleasure. Okay, it's going to be interesting, I know. Also, Gary Robinson is the Vice President of the Union for National Defense Employees, the UNDE. Thanks for joining us as well. Thank you. And then we have Pat Maxwell, and she's with the clerical workers for the UNDE. Now, that puts the two of you in a civilian category, right? That's correct. correct. Yeah, yeah, well, I'm glad that you could all join us. Thank you. And now, I want to start with you, Gary. Uh, okay, you're, you're at the civilian side. Uh, I have no concept of this, so why don't you tell us what your issue is, as far as you're concerned? Uh, our issues are uh, that we're underpaid. Uh, we're agreeing that the, the lower ranks in the military are definitely underpaid, but besides them, we're way lower. Uh, we haven't had a raise, or we've had one raise in the last seven years, and it was 3%. Right. Uh, the GST has been added on since then, so that takes, a, the, at 7%, that takes our raise away and puts us down 4%. Right. Cost of living has been 1% to 2% for the last seven years, so we're down about uh, 15% or whatever. Now, I've read reports that some people who are involved, who are in the military, even the civilian workers, are having to go to welfare or social services for assistance, and there was even a toy drive for people who were on the base. That's pretty shocking. It, it is, it, but it's true. That's the That's problem. That's amazing. Uh, our wages are that low, uh, especially in the clerical workers yeah. and uh, the lower ranks in the military, the, the privates that get in and that. Okay. And up to about corporal. After corporal, they start making more than a civilian does at the same level, mm -hmm. but it's still not enough to live on, especially in Victoria. Okay, now Pat, uh, clerical workers, as they, they keep, we keep hearing, are basically at the bottom of the, of the list. I've also seen that there's a pay equity issue that's been raised nationally. What, uh, first of all, what do you do, and, and how would it be something that we'd be interested in? Number one, I'm an administration clerk for D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. um, we're the support group for the military, is what it is. We support the military. Um, we have had a wage freeze. We also, with the pay equity, have had, have been fighting the pay equity for 13 years. The complaint went in 13 years ago. Wow. And so you're, you're just starting to be heard on some levels, I see. That's correct. Okay. This is interesting. Now, uh, Vice Admiral Chuck Thomas, now you are someone who was involved in this a long time ago. I sort of sometimes think of the, the glory days of, of the Canadian uh, military, Navy, and, and, and Air Force. And, and you've seen the changes. I've heard some of your comments. You've been very passionate about this. Why don't you give us an idea about how you perceive this? Yeah, I'd love to, because nobody else is. Like the civilian counterparts, the folks in the military have had their wages frozen for five years. Before the wages were frozen, there was a structure in place that said the pay for the military will be locked to the pay for the civil service. Right. There were equivalent benchmarks. Right. And before that pay freeze started, they were 4 to 12% behind the policy benchmark. Okay, so See, they weren't even keeping up. No, they weren't keeping up. Okay. There's no constituency. There's nothing to motivate the bureaucrats to bring the military up to some even level and the politicians didn't seem to be interested and then the pay freeze came on top of that. While the pay freeze was on, the government increased the rents for the married quarters. Well see a lot of people think that those quarters are free. Oh, heavens no. 
they uh, pay an equal economic rate for the area they're in, which means military quarters here in Victoria are tied to the Victoria cost of rent. Oh, wow. And okay. they've gone up $250 per quarter during this five-year pay phrase. Per month. Per month. Mm -hmm. UI has increased. Canada Pension has increased. All the premiums, yeah. The medical plan has had its its deductible increase. Right. The same thing has happened to their dental plan. And what five years, six years ago, was a mid-career serviceman who had some money in the bank, he had some future, his kids could do things other kids do, like hockey or dancing. Right. He's now bankrupt. He's going to food banks three days a week That's to feed his shocking. kids, and he's going to Salvation Army to get Christmas presents and clothes. And if that doesn't make somebody who is concerned about the military passionate, nothing will. Yeah. I had, frankly, in the six years since I've been out, it's deteriorated to the point where I was shocked at the committee hearings. And I knew it was bad, yeah. but I didn't know it was as bad as it was. Okay, I want to uh, I want to get from you as well, uh, you know, what, how you think this affects Canada's national defense and, and our role in the world stage. We're going to take some calls first, sure. though. And as we go through the show, we have the, we have the hour, and we want to hear from you on all aspects of this. I'm sure too, because I think uh, there are a lot of people who are going to be monitoring today's show, and so if there are things we'd like to say to the military one way or the other, it's probably a good time to to chat about that. And uh, we'll go to the phone, starting with John in Victoria. Hi, John. Yes, hello. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to uh, make a quick comment, and then I have a, uh, a very brief question. Uh, I'd like to mention that um, uh, we've heard of NAFTA and all the various budget cutbacks over the years with the, uh, the federal government, and as a result uh, of that, the provincial governments have been cutting back as well. Right. Now, uh, what we're feeling now, or what we're seeing here with all these people that are uh, working for the federal government, and the military uh, having to go to food banks and things is is an indirect result of what has been when been taking place over the last several years with all these cutbacks we are now starting to feel it it is uh, absolutely disgraceful to say the least mm -hmm. now my question is if the federal government now has a budget surplus right. why instead of trying and trying to figure out where they're going to spend this money yeah. Address this situation right here. Okay. Pay our military people a decent wage yeah. and pay the civil servants a decent living wage so they don't have to go to food banks. Okay, well, thank you for that. I think that's a, a good question. What kind of response ha have any of you had? Oh, I'll ask you again then, Mr. Thomas. What kind of response have you had after your presentation at the public hearing? Any, any idea that the federal government might be listening to this? No, I haven't. The parliamentarians who are in the committee, I think by the end of the evenings, and the next day's briefings were really moved. I mean, they have enough data to know there's a problem, and they're very doubtful of their own ability to convince their colleagues in Ottawa wow. that this situation is real. Now, they were mainly government MPs as well. They were, they were absolutely. Yeah. So they have to get into the problems of caucus discipline right. and motivate uh, you know, the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Defense to act on this issue, and I think they're doubtful about their ability to do that. Wow. Yeah. Okay. They're doing nothing for us. Uh, right now we're at collective right. bargaining, yeah. and 3% uh, in seven years, and they just offered us 1% and 1%, and they want to take back on our overtime, on our weekends, on any premiums that we do have, which are very little. They've legislated everything away from us. Our job security, they've legislated. It's like they're and trying to break the, uh, break the union, which is good. They're trying to break the union in the lower ranks of the military. Uh, yeah. My opinion is it's the DMC, which is the Defense Management Committee that sits in Ottawa, are not telling the, the politicians what's going on, and that's the problem. I went down to Dave Anderson's office, and he was unaware of what's going on. Right, and so And he is looking into going. some of this stuff for us now. Okay. But it's the Defense Management Committee coming up with all these rules and regulations, yeah. trying to get rid of the civilians in the lower ranks, okay. and they're doing a fairly good job. We have to uh, take a break. We're a little late for a break, and we'll come back. We're taking more of your calls, and we're talking about the state of the military in Canada right now. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome to the ocean. Dreams last for so long. 
start your workday with 98 minutes of music commercial free. The Ocean FM 98.5. Yeah, Ocean FM 98.5. Yeah, Ocean FM 98.5. Victoria's at work choice, the ocean. Listen. Victoria, British Columbia doesn't close down after the summer sunsets. In fact, Victoria is even more enjoyable now during our secret season. Just call the Canadian Pacific's Empress Hotel and we'll tell you how to save on your stay with the Empress. Enjoy Empress afternoon tea. Take in the world-class Royal BC Museum. Go for a romantic carriage ride. We have a lot of other little secrets to offer, but you'll have to call to find out more about Victoria's secret season at the Empress. Once a year for one day, United Carpet makes it even easier to buy floor coverings. It's United Carpet's Crazy Carpet Caper. Save on every floor covering in the store. This is the biggest carpet sales event of the year. Doors open at 6 a.m. on Saturday, February 7th. Huge savings on absolutely everything in the store. Six months are as good as cash. Get Air Miles Travel Miles. Come see this special. United Carpets Crazy Carpet Caper, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. only on Saturday, February 6th. United Carpet, we got personality. In the hands of our Van City members, we know how things are grown, created, cared for. So when they put their money in our hands, our goal is to do the same. That's why we offer the broadest range of RSP options, including term deposits, that allow you to switch to any one of over 400 mutual funds through our partner credential securities. So for all your RSP needs, call us today. Because in the right hands, your RSP has a stronger future. Van City, it's right here. And we're talking about the state of the military in Canada and BC, and we'll go straight back to the phones. And we'll start with Betty on Saturna Island. Hi, Betty. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm all for them getting paid properly and all that for it, but these percentages really throw me, because I don't know, and no one knows, what the dollars and cents are. So, okay. And then it'd be a better understanding for us, and then you'd get more backing, I think. Okay, well, uh, thank you for putting that up. Can, can we... Show this then, Kevin, up in the, dire the invisible director. I'm going to see if I can show you this. This might be helpful. Now, this is a comparison of salaries. This bottom one with the triangles is what has come out of the Navy. That's what you will get as far as a pay scale for people who are in the Navy. The civilian police, that's what a police officer will make, and it goes up like that. And then this middle one is um, the firefighters, and then that's the military. So you can see that they, they fall well below what uh, police or or firefighters make. Um, but to give us an idea though, I mean obviously if you're going to food banks, you're going to get that. Um, what kind of comments do you have on, on what kind of pay scale you have? Uh, okay, with the firefighters right now, our firefighters, and they've done a real good job fighting the, the Russian ship fire. If they yeah. hadn't had firefighters that knew on board ship fighting, we might have had problems there. But they're $11,000 less than outside firefighter for the city of Victoria. Right. And, and that's where the shame is in it. They're risking their lives. They have to have more skills than an outside firefighter in a lot of ways because they got nuclear response, they got on board firefighting, and they have to be trained in ammunition firefighting. So they're well, they're well trained. Well they're, trained. Yeah, that's a significant But low paid. Okay. They're losing their top firefighters to the city and other places because they can go there for 20000 11000 more. They right. get good training, right. but that's it. Okay. Let me give you some numbers, Judy. Uh, a recruit joins the armed forces, a private, right. makes 17000 a year right. before taxes. A mid-career journeyman, a corporal, and he's going to stay a corporal because downsizing says there's no promotion, makes 32000 Wow. So that could be something that you're going to be making for a long period of oh, time. Oh, absolutely. And you want to say something? Too? Yeah. And my equivalent would be a corporal. And I make tw just over twenty-six thousand dollars a year. Okay, and that so that that gives people some idea of uh, of the right. career in the military. Okay, let's talk to John now in White Rock. Hi, John. Yeah, that's why I want to know was the pay scale. Right. Uh, with the clerical staff. Right. In the military, uh, is is uh, with their pay scale compared to like the private sector? Like I work in the uh, customs brokerage industry, right? And uh, the highest that we could get is like maybe maybe eighteen thousand a year. Wow! And uh, like nice. right now, I have a condo that I'm paying off, a hundred thousand dollar condo. So I'm like living within my means. Yeah. So they're a little bit higher than the private sector. 
Okay. Well, with, with, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, let, let me ask you about that. Do you, when you look at your pay scale, do you compare it with the private sector or do you compare it with the um, uh, bureaucracy? Just out of curiosity, like, how, do, does is there an examination of what the private sector is making? We compare with the private sector. The government, no matter what area, the government comes under the same contract, so you can work for any different department, and they're basically the same, except for the Department of National Defense, because there's different levels. We Our clerical starts at a CR2, a CR3, and a CR4, and you move up. Our department is the only department in all Canada that has a CR2 or a CR3. CR3s are very rare in other departments. So being the lowest paid, yeah. they're at the lowest scale, and that's about 18000 What about south of the border, then? I mean, how, do, how does a Canadian military pay compare? I'll ask you about this. It's significantly less. Uh, they did studies uh, when Mr. Young was the minister mm -hmm. of the British and American systems. And, of course, the results were not complimentary to Canada, so the studies have never been released. Are they available somewhere? Sure, you can get access to information to get them, but, uh, I mean, general officers in Canada make about half what general officers make in the United Kingdom. Wow. Make about 40% less than what general officers make in the United States, and it goes all the way down the line. Okay. There's also a benefits issue. I mean, in the United States, the government buys the pension for the serviceman. Right. Here, the serviceman buys his own pension, and so do these folks. Right. Yes. So there's, I guess, a whole gamut of things. It'll be interesting to see what the federal government's response is to the parliamentary hearings. Let's talk to Bobby in Victoria now. Hi, Bobby. Hi. Hi, go ahead. Um, I live in PMQs out in Belmont Park. PMQs? And, yeah, okay. private married card. Okay. And um, I know the PMQ I live in. My husband, we moved in when he was an ordinary seaman or a private. And we pay three fifteen a month, or a month, but right. it's going to go up fifty dollars at the end of February because he's no longer protected. Okay. And like we we pay all of the bills. We have to pay. We have to buy all our appliances when we move in. Mm -hmm. Like nothing's included. So it's not the same as if you rented an apartment off uh, off site. No, oh, no. Okay. Like I just got a hundred and thirty dollar gas bill today. Right. And I had eighty five last last month and seventy five them up before. We never paid that much when we were on oil. Right. And they've changed it now. The center gas rates went up January 1st. So is it, did you or your husband make a submission to the hearings then? Well, actually, I was babysitting. I couldn't make it. <laughs> okay, you're trying to bring in a few extra dollars, eh? Yeah, well, yeah. I'm trying to, yeah, yeah. because he's, he's an able seaman, and there's no pay increase between ordinary seaman and able seaman. Okay. The only pay increase is when you get to kill it or leading seaman. And he was supposed to get that in September, but he was told now that he might have to wait till March, and then he'll have to wait another two months after that to get his money. So, what's the morale like? Do you oh, know? it's it's bad. Yeah. My dad was a uh, my dad retired with 25 years in, and he loves the Navy. Yeah. But today's Navy is nothing like the Navy he grew up in. Okay. Well, thank you for that, Betty. Um, I think this brings us to a point where we should take a look at these. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the public hearings that were held were last week in Victoria. And uh, about a week ago, then, all these MPs came in from Ottawa, and to give them credit, they sat there and they listened to what people had to say, and here's a little clip of that. No matter whom I talk to in the squadron, the discussions always come around to, how are we going to get by this month? Everybody is concerned about what they're paying out and what they're getting in. And I haven't done the, the detailed analysis of what the pay adjustments have done to my pay, but. My January take-home pay is $50 less than my September one was. I'd like to um, express my dissatisfaction with our medical and dental plans. Um, our de deductible, as you heard earlier, was increased from $40 to $100 last year. And for our family, um, with food and environmental allergies, $100 um, lost is a big deal. Sometimes when it comes to medicine, we ha we've had to wait as well because we can't afford to pay for the medicine that month, so we have to make, wait to next month, or we charge it on our credit cards, which are often um, to the maximum as it is. So I'm virtually sitting here, and probably for five to seven years, not having the money in the bank to go see my family, to go get the support I need, to take my children to see their grandparents, it won't happen, because I have no money in the bank because of a forced move. You either go or get out were the exact words that were told to my husband. It is your choice. You either move or you get out. The way they worded it to him was his COS date, which is the date to arrive here, would be his release date. We have three children and the security of a job and a pension at the end 
we had no choice. My husband could go and pump gas, sure, on the East Coast, but with the economy that it is, living on the economy, we thought, well, do we live on the economy or do we keep this security and this pension that we're going to get eventually and live on a low salary? We chose to move, but because we felt we had to. So I'm here, and unfortunately, I don't like it. And I, don't, I think there's a lot of people in my situation. I do the best. I do the best for my kids, and I do the best with what I have. But this is hell. Thank you. I think in her case, too, she was talking about the higher cost of living coming from Halifax to Victoria. Um, we'll go back to the phones, and then I'll ask you a little bit more about the morale issue. Uh, let's talk to Don, though, up in Comox. Hi, Don. Hello, how are you? Fine, thanks. Go ahead. I think the situation goes far greater than just pay. It's apparent that the esprit de corps in the Canadian forces today is completely gone. And I would have thought that your panel would have included a serviceman to give some indication of what's gone on there. I, I think, think a lot of the them are pretty reluctant to speak out right now. So that's we have to be careful who we include in the panel. But have, yeah. haven't been in the in the ranks for 24 years, I can empathize with that situation, but yeah. I do think that your story is almost one-sided here because they don't give any of the good parts that are still left in the armed forces, and I'm sure there must be some good parts. For one thing, they haven't mentioned that they do have very good job security. You're good to the expiration of your contract regardless of uh, what your, your, the way you work or if you're I wouldn't say you, you could be kept in as long as you're incompetent, but as long as you're doing your job, to some extent, you are guaranteed your job until the expiration of your contract. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop you there only because we, we're late for break and all the guests are shaking their heads. So um, who well, wants to take well, this? I can on? start. No one's got job security in the Army, Air Force, Navy, or civilians. No one. Uh, now no. you sign up for two to three years. You can't sign up for five years anymore. And there's no such thing as a 25-year military personnel unless you're exceptional and they have some reason to keep you. Uh, so the that's civilian, a yeah. change. When did that happen? Uh, two, three years ago so with legislation. There's no such thing as a career in either one. Okay. Uh, civilians have no job security at all. They right. legislated that out two years ago when they took our workforce adjustment away from us. Okay. I want the, the esprit de corps, the, the idea that there's a, a feeling beyond that. I have to tell you that in that uh, evening when the parliamentary committee was here, I've never ever in the service experienced the combination of rage and despair that was evident in that room. I mean, these aren't wasteful, spendthrift people. Mm -hmm. These are families that are trying to stay together and live and having a great deal of difficulty. I wouldn't believe when I left five years ago, six years ago, that a mid-career journeyman would be having to go to a food bank. Yeah, I guess And that does thing. dreadful things to morale. Yeah. And we haven't talked about it, and your caller was correct. I mean, these are folks who are spending 200 days a year away from home at sea. And they have every expectation that that's going to happen every year. Right. Because downsizing and what is called alternate service delivery, which is the government spinning off out to private industry, has taken away all the seashore ratio. Okay, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, the idea about yeah. contracting out a little later. Um, the lines are jammed, and we will be back with more of your calls on uh, the state of the military in B.C. Tayam She is brought to you in part by Metro Lexus Toyota, leaders in customer satisfaction. Some thoughts on getting things right. You know how your period can start off really heavy and then end up kind of light? Oh, yeah. So I thought, why am I using only one kind of tampon? This is a big question. With Tampex, I can get the right protection at the right time. Super for those heavy days. Regulars for the middle. And these great little lights. Way more comfortable on my light days. Why didn't I think of this before? Tampax. This, this is good news. Tampax. Women know. Ooh, ugly dirt. On Tough Greasy Dirt, this leading disinfecting cleaner makes you work too hard. It's easy with Mr. Clean. Cleaning's a snap. Oh, yeah. It gets it all shiny clean. We power through the work and it's so easy to do it. Me and the big guy. Nothing to it, Mr. Clean. He's tough.
off on dirt, easy on you. Quality stands the test of time. Now blend new country furniture with fine antiques from Cobble Hill Country Furnishings. Select from unique pieces. Complement your purchase with country furniture, made to stand the test of time. Fine antiques and fine country furniture are on display at our showroom or visit our store. Cobble Hill Country Furnishings, timeless furniture for your home, inside and out. Cobble Hill Country Furnishings, tomorrow's news today. Because you want both sides of the story. But these guys have to make a living. Because you want more than a score. You know, he's one of the all-time greats. And I guess we'll find out. Because you want to be informed and entertained. The eye in the sky, Sean Webster. Oh, they're getting slippery again. Because you deserve the best choice for live, local, late-breaking news. CKNW 98. All you need to know. Today we're talking about military pay and the state of the military. Our guests are Gary Robinson, he's the Vice President of the Union of National Defense Employees. Pat Maxwell is also with the UNDE, she's a group of clerical workers. And Vice Admiral Chuck Thomas, retired, is joining us and you may have heard him on the radio or seen him on the news talking about what's going on with military pay. And let's see, we will start with Bill in Chilliwack on the phone. Hi Bill. Hello. Hi. It's your turn. Am I on? You are. Oh, sorry, the line's a little rough. That's okay. Uh, I have two things I'd like to mention. Okay. Uh, that are, that are, uh, haven't been mentioned as of yet, but it's, it's uh, I think, a very, very important consideration. First of all, there's one major difference between military personnel and other personnel. Okay. And, 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 one of the, and that difference is something that we don't recognize till Remembrance Day, but every one of those people in the military has offered up his life in the service of his country. Or her. You know, the ultimate impact of, 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 of his service may in fact be his death or his or her death or, 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 or serious injury. Right. Now, you, it's very difficult to imagine how to compensate for that. But the reason I mention that is I lost a good friend on a landmine in Croatia in 1994. Wow. Uh, I myself was released from the military, um, disabled and, and, and medically released from the military in 1990. Right. Our pensions and compensation for the families and stuff is tied directly to the pay program so oh. that we receive actually uh, remuneration based on a percentage of the pay that's already been acknowledged as being very uh, exactly right. very insufficient and unjust. So your friend's family is in rough straits. Yes. Now the other thing that comes into it as well mm -hmm. is that, that people don't realize is mm -hmm. as a soldier you cannot go to an insurance company on Civvy Street and get life insurance that will apply during your military service. Really? Yep. So if you die while in the service of the military, you can't be covered by a private plan? You got it. Oh, that's crazy. Okay, well, thank you for that perspective. That's really uh, bothersome. He, he's talking about in a combat environment. I mean, if, you're, if you have life insurance and you're killed crossing the street, well, that's, that's one thing. Yeah. But if you're in Bosnia, yeah. it's different. So if the government doesn't protect you, you're, you're really out on a limb. The government offers you the chance to buy at your own expense yeah. insurance from uh, CISIP, which is a plan they've put in place. But you've got to buy it. Mm -hmm. It's not a gift from a grateful country. Right. Okay. Country's not very grateful. Now, when they talk about this, in your case, were you putting your life on the line as well in service? No, I, or? Well, I went to sea. Yeah. Uh, it's a dangerous place, the ocean. Yeah. Uh, was I ever in a war zone? No, I wasn't. Uh, lucky me. Yeah, very fortunate. Uh, there may be a lot of people in Canada right now faced with the possibility of going over to the Middle East, and that would be uh, kind of scary for the families. Yeah. And uh, a lot of the civilians are uh, handling ammunition all the time. We have an ammunition You're depot kidding. right here. Uh, I'm an ammunition worker myself. I, what does that mean? I make the bombs for the Navy, the Air Force, I put in the detonators, I handle the explosives, and low paid, $16 an hour, and I put my life on the line every day I go out there. I'm working with ammunition, and that's what they pay us. I got 25 years in, $16 an hour, and that's the tops I can go. Wow. That's it. And that's being underpaid, 25 years for that. Okay, well, let's talk to Trudy in Victoria. Hi, Trudy. Hello. Hi, go ahead. Vice Admiral, do you remember the time in Calgary and Edmonton where we went through the same problem? And that was before we had to buy the appliances for our PMQs. Yes, I do. This is not a new, uh, a new issue. Uh, it's particularly acute here in Victoria because of the cost of living, but it was then in Calgary when Calgary had gold on the streets. So in that case, uh, that was how long ago? Well, I've been out six years, so it's eight. 
nine Eight. years ago. Okay, and in that case, she sounds like she's saying it's worse now. I think she probably yeah. agrees well, that it's worse he now. To, if you didn't have to buy your appliances, you wanted to make a comment. I uh, just want to make comments. I know in the PMQs it is tough. And they, that, the but PMQs I are the private married quarters. Quarters, that's okay. correct. Um, but the civilian workers are having just a tough time. Um, during the Christmas holidays, I was helping make up food basket for one family in particular. She works at the base and is one of the low-paid people. Her husband has had temporary positions but hasn't been able to nail down a job permanently. They actually had their power cut off and their heat cut off. The military cut off their power? No, they didn't live in the PM. This is a civilian person, so oh, they live okay. on the outside. Yeah. Um, they live in Souk in order to be able to afford a rent. And they have to, they have to travel back and forth. So Okay. Well, we're going to uh, give you a, another idea about the pay scale. So a lot of questions of that coming up in the earlier segments. So let's take a quick snapshot. And uh, we didn't boil down everything for you. But the majority of Union of National Defense employee members work in clerical jobs. A clerk two position starts at $20,126 a year. And the top pay in that position is 21842 And there is no opportunity for overtime. A general laborer starts at twelve seventy three an hour, tops out at sixteen sixty four, which is in the twenty eight thousand dollar per year category plus overtime. And a general services worker starts at ten oh two an hour, and the top of the scale for that job, if you can get there, is seventeen dollars and eighteen cents an hour, which is about nineteen thousand two hundred. And a firefighter starts at just over twenty nine thousand dollars a year. The top pay for that job is over thirty one thousand. So you can see, actually, when you start to compare it with the um, with the other governmental sectors or private sectors, it's uh, not a lot of money. And if you spend 25 years, and that's as high as you can go. Uh, uh, some of the civilians are getting second jobs. Is that right? That's correct. To there's supplement a, their income? Yeah, there's a lot of them that are getting second jobs, especially single parents. Right. And what is happening is they're getting second jobs, but now they've left their children. Well, yeah, if you're a single For parent, two. you've got two jobs. And you've got two jobs, so who's taking care of the kids? I mean, we're, you know. It's a vicious circle, I guess. Let's talk to Lisa in Duncan. Hi, Lisa. Yes, hi. hi. I have um, just a comment as far as the military pay scale. Mm -hmm. um, people don't seem to realize that these, these fellows, when they go away either peacekeeping or at sea for six months or eight months on a deployment, they don't get over time. Right. They're, they're working 12 hours a day, seven days a week, and, and you break down their annual salary, and they are making way under minimum wage. And it's not like they get coffee breaks. They don't. Right, <laughs> right. Okay, well, thank you for that. that that's an important perspective, too. Yeah. This is a very, very demanding job. Um, uh, the, one thing I want to add to this is uh, uh, until the ice storms and some of the recent sort of uh, good press that the military's had, the last few years, if you'd asked people about the military, they would have said, oh, it's Somalia. Oh, it's uh, all this thing that's going on overseas. And I'm not sure how much confidence I have. And, and many of the people I knew who were involved were really hurt by that. I mean, they felt very badly mm -hmm. that they were being lumped in, and, and it was just a broad brush over all the Canadian forces. It must be tough, on the one hand, to be facing that kind of publicity on the outside and this kind of environment on the inside. Uh, how are people dealing with that? Is, it, is, it, is there a way to deal with morale internally? Oh, that's, that's a tough one. We've been trying to deal with it. It's, you feel like you're being kicked all the time down. The Somali incident, the things happened that probably shouldn't have happened, but they tar everyone with the same brush. And since then, things have been happening. If you notice with the federal budget, our department since 1994 has went down, down, down. We have lost over 12,000 civilian employees in Canada in the last three years in our union alone. Is that from down, like um, not rehiring? or Not rehiring, downsizing and all this because the government is not putting money into the Department of National Defense right. and it cannot continue. And that's one of the problems why we're having these problems in other countries because there's not time to train the troops how to peacekeep, there's not the money there and they're sending them over. In Petawawa, when they sent them to Bosnia last year, or the year before, they were sending their stuff in green garbage bags. They don't have the equipment to send them, Jeez. and that's part of the problem. That's just bizarre. Now, uh, I think, are we at break time, guys? We are. Okay. Just before we go to the break, though, we'd like to give you some uh, uh, information if you want to contact our guests. You can contact the Union of National Defense Employees, and the phone number is 250-383-5551, and the fax number is 250-383-8301. And uh, during one of the breaks, we asked you if um, who people should write to if they're upset about this, and you said... The, the Prime, Prime Minister. Minister. Yeah. The Prime He's Minister. the only guy that's going to change this situation. Yeah. 
Um, and he has okay. to have the will and want to do it. Okay. Otherwise, they're going to continue to suffer. Okay, so Prime Minister Chrétien is at the House of Commons in Ottawa, and you don't even have to put a stamp on it. And we'll be back after a quick break. amazingly clear. The digital PCS network. Be free. BC Tel Mobility. Welcome back to coverage of the four men late for the meeting race. And Frank, we're here with the guys from accounting and their neon from Chrysler. Gene, look at their start time. Now that's a hair faster than last week. Frank, you have to give credit for that 132 horsepower engine. Oh, they're taking a shortcut through the alley. Oh, a wrong turn. That's oh. going to cost them time, Frank. They got a perfect line through the S-turn. Talk about working in unison. Look at that. And wow, this could be a new record. Yes, the 98 Neon. With Air and Auto, just 188 a month. Only at your local BC Chrysler dealer. It has been said that we are unusually ethical, unusually concerned with community and environment, that we are unusually generous. But then, if other financial institutions had grown up with this perspective all around them, then maybe they would see things the right way too. For all of your financial needs, call us today. Van City, it's right here. Real quickly, I've got something to show you. BioGuard Pool and Spa Chemicals. By the way, I'm Grant, and I own vintage hot tubs. If you're looking for built to last, the guaranteed lowest running cost, and the ultimate in hydrotherapy performance, come visit our showroom at 2000 Government Street. We've all been in business 20 years. Besides saunas and gazebos, we've got portable paradise breeze rooms. Custom built retractable sunrooms, isn't that great? And we also design and build sun decks. One more thing, we've got private test soak rooms that'll make you feel like gold. Oh, there's my wife. And we're talking about the state of the military in Canada, especially in BC, and we'll go back to the lines. Lots of people on the island want to talk about this. We'll start with Patricia in Port Alberni. Hi, Patricia. Okay. Patricia, are you there? Up in Port Alberni, one last chance. Okay, sometimes people get caught with that delay. Let's talk to Frank then in Victoria. Hi, Frank. Hi, how are you today, Judy? Fine, thanks, go ahead. Uh, I think what we need to uh, at least uh, separate the apples and oranges here is that the military are a professional group. Mm -hmm. uh, they're professional military. Right. They put themselves on the line, whether they're cooks, infanteers, whether they're uh, privates or generals. Mm -hmm. uh, it makes no difference. Uh, when the gun fires, if you're in front of it, you get killed right. or wounded or maimed. Right. And the bomb goes off. So that's an important distinction. And this is our professional Canadian military. Mm -hmm. So if we want to be proud of it, and we want to make sure it protects Canada, then we better start hiring professional military people and paying them that way. So you mean make sure that they're properly trained and well paid? Well, if they're professionals and they're military, they mm -hmm. have to be. Okay. Because you're going to throw them into uh, areas where there are wars or where people are attempting to take over Canada mm -hmm. or where we are trying to prevent that from happening in a so-called peace zone. Okay. The, the other problem is that the military themselves have no representation by association, union, or other negotiating group. And we need to authorize the military mm -hmm. to form an association. They don't want to be a union mm -hmm. because... Like a professional association, like the registered nurses or yeah, something. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Someone who speaks for the military. Okay, well let me ask about that then. Um, you mentioned during the break something about the social contract being violated. He's, he's sort of making a reference. Oh, to absolutely. He's right on the mark. There is, in my opinion, an explicit, expl explicit, uh, implicit uh, social contract between the government and the people of its armed force. It's three parts, quite simple. It says you're not going to commit them to places where they're liable to get killed unless it matters to Canada. Okay. It secondly says if you're going to send them to do work, you're going to buy the tools before you send them. 
All right, which it makes reference to the fact that they're and the, the third resources. part says you're going to look after their welfare and the welfare of their families. In exchange for them putting their lives on the line. So let's examine those three parts. We're sending them off to places in the world where we talk about peacekeeping, but there's no peace to keep. Peacemaking, Chapter 7, Somalia, is war, just by another name. Okay. But that, we don't like to admit to that. So what do so you say when you say that? It. Are you saying that we're sending our people right into a war zone? Absolutely. And Somalia was a war zone. Bosnia is a war zone. If that little adventure in South Central Africa had come off, we would have been in some big trouble. My opinion, the body bags would have come home. Are you talking about Rwanda then? No, we were going to go off to Central Africa and oh. help sort out... Uh, some of their internal policies exactly. or something. Okay, and there so isn't any side to keep peace with. Now, the second part says, buy the tools. Right. Navy's a work in progress. Haven't bought the helicopters and the submarine. Yeah. They don't even start with the helicopters. <laughs> thing. Oh, the Air goodness. Force is getting old. Yeah. And the Army is tragic. We got 35-year-old armored personnel carriers being refurbished in New Brunswick. It's a political deal. It has nothing to do with their ability to fight. Now, governments invest today in the equipment of the armed forces, so governments tomorrow have some options. Because mm -hmm. it takes 10 years to deliver this equipment. Right. The problem is that in crisis, governments will use the armed forces it's got with whatever equipment they've Which got. Which could be almost worse than saying we don't have anything. Exactly. Send it to oh, I get it. Okay. And the, the final point is the point we're talking today. about is looking after the welfare of the people and their families and it's demonstrable by any standard we're not doing that. So we Canadians and our representatives in Ottawa and the government are perpetrating a fraud. And the folks in the armed forces are getting shafted and they don't deserve that. And if you don't like it, write your prime minister and tell him so. Okay, well, a very articulate statement on that. Let's talk to Sheila in Shawnigan Lake. Hi, Sheila. Hi. Hi, go ahead. I just want to know, like, some of us choose to purchase a house instead of renting for the rest of our lives, and when the husband retires, mm -hmm. you're stuck renting. Right. But now when you do that, you get another slap in the face. You lo lose an accommodation allowance. Oh, so you're saying that if you do get a chance to buy something, you exactly. don't... Exactly. Oh, okay. You lose an accommodation allowance, whereas the people who are in the PFQs, which there's not enough in Victoria to house everybody, right. um, they get the accommodation allowance, plus they're getting a bit of a subsidized rent. Okay. So, you know, like, there's no justice there either. So that doesn't make either. any sense. No, yeah. exactly. Okay, well, thanks for that. Now, why would you be punished for buying a house? Any ideas on that? Uh, no idea. I don't know. <laughs> no idea. Is this one of those things where it looks like someone's made up the policy based on, you know, a bunch of people having coffee and don't know what they're talking they about? They talk about renting and decide they need to do something about renting and forget that that's just one choice for what you do with your disposable income. You either buy or rent. Mm -hmm. It's a moot point in Victoria, though. It's expensive either because way. Because a starter yeah. house, median starter house in Victoria is about 175 to 180,000. Yeah, Nobody in the military except a chief warrant officer in the lower ranks qualifies for a mortgage. Right. So, m so almost everybody's disqualified as soon as they arrive, and uh, if the family helps them buy a house, then they don't get their living allowance. Exactly. Great. Uh, anyway, we have to take a break, and we'll be right back with more of your calls. We're talking about military pay. Sunday, February 8th is Ladies' Day at Fraser Downs, sponsored by the Bay. For the ladies, free admission, gift packs, and two $1,000 Bay shopping sprees to be won. See ads to the Province Sports Thursday and Friday, February 5th and 6th for details. Fraser Downs, Canada's newest 5-8 mile track. Today, hospitality is Canada's third largest industry and growing. You can get the skills you need to be part of this exciting industry in as little as six months. At Compu College School of Business, we offer training in hotel and restaurant operations, bar management, travel and tourism, and more. And we're part of International Business Schools, one of the largest training institutions of its kind in Canada. Compu College School of Business, fast, recognized training that works. Call now. The future is yours. You're looking at the sport utility vehicle from Toyota that spells fun. Buy the 98 RAV4 and enjoy the safety of full-time four-wheel drive. 
go anywhere in BC with big 16-inch tires. It all adds up to value for fun with Toyota's exciting RAV4. Toyota is BC's number one selling import. Save over $3,000 with 4.8 no limit financing over 60 months. Make haste, the fast start sales event at your Toyota BC dealers. I can say, where's the bathroom in 12 languages? Canada Trust asks, are you a world expert? Never go under 50 on the Autobahn. The bus tour of the Sahara, not a good idea. You may be a world expert in your own way, but for world investment expertise, turn to Canada Trust Mutual Funds. We partner with some of the world's leading investment experts for our new Global Asset Allocation Fund, giving you the performance of global markets. And it's fully RSP eligible. For world investment expertise, call Canada Trust Mutual Funds. We're talking about military pay, and we'll try to get quite a few calls in if we can. We'll start with Norm in Duncan. Hi, Norm. Yeah, hi. Hi, go ahead. Yeah, what I was going to say is, like, I've worked for the Coast Guard for 20, over 26 years. Yeah. I take home 450 a week, but yet these strikers in Crofton, they're getting $400, $400 a week uh, strike pay. So there where people say, well, about the, um, the difference in wages, well, there you go. From yeah, that's sector. a good example of that, yeah. And, and also, also now that they're saying... Um, you have to pay for your parking when you're in uh, Victoria. Uh, huh? Like when we go away to sea, right. we have to pay for our parking. And you mean like if that. you leave your car here because you're going out to sea? Yeah, the, um, they sent a memo out saying that uh, we'll be charged at the going rate. That's nuts. And if you're in the Coast Guard, I guess you've got a lot of issues there as well with equipment, don't you? Oh, definitely. definitely. Okay, well, thanks for calling. Uh, boy, you know what? can get very depressing. Um, I'm going to take another call and then we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit. But it can be a little overwhelming. Um, let's talk to Jason up in Campbell River. Hi, Jason. Hi, I just have a question for Chuck. Okay. Why are you so bitter? Oh, uh, I guess I'm uh, angry more than bitter. I'm angry because I think these are good people who are serving Canada uh, who didn't commit to be poor. I mean, they didn't expect to get rich. But they are... They're officers they don't think can be of help to them. They're not certain their admirals can help them. And it's probably demonstrable that both those things are true. Um, I think the situation's got a whole lot worse in the last six or seven years to the point where somebody better talk about it. It's unusual for someone in your position to even speak out, isn't it? No, when you're in uniform, you're not allowed to be critical of the government. Right. Which really ties the hands of all the say. serving leaders. Yeah. But, you know... Nobody ties my hands on any subject. I can say anything I like, right. and this annoys me, which is why I'm here. Okay, well, I'm glad you are here. Let's talk to Tara now in Comox. Hi, Tara. Hi. Hi, go ahead. Um, um, I guess my comment or question would be, um, I'm a military wife living in uh, the PMQs in Comox. Right. And we just came from uh, Calgary a year and a half ago, and we were living in the same uh, PMQs there in Calgary, paying uh, $300 a month rent there. When we come out here, we're offered the same PMQ, yet they want to charge us $100 more. And we also know of people um, who live all across Canada, like down east, say, in Greenwood, right. who's the same rank as my husband, the same time in, and yet they're only being charged $280 a month for the same PMQ that we paid $400 for. So what you're saying is everybody gets paid the same amount for salary, but depending on where you live, you're going to be charged a different amount for the same quarters. Well, exactly, and, and I don't understand how they can get away with that. Like, if, if they're going to do that, then I, I believe that maybe there should be, a, a, like, a cost of living increase to those of us who do have to pay more for a PMQ. Okay, well, thanks for the question. Okay. Yeah, the Canadian government or our Department of National Defense decided that it was unfair to the communities around the military bases to compete against the rent for the outside, the outside people renting, saying it's not fair because you're renting. So now they turned it over to its Canadian Forces Housing Association, and their object now is to make money. Oh, they yeah. have to make money off the PMQs. The repairs won't be done on timely as they were. Uh, government workers don't look after them. They contract them, most of them out where they bring a contractor in to repair them and fix them up. So now it's a money thing again, and that's why it's different all over Canada. Now, the other issue that we sort of touched on but didn't get a chance to talk about was this idea of contracting out and the yeah. fact that the military is looking at contracting out all kinds of civilian services. They're what looking is at that contracting about? everything out, the ammunition workers. Well, so what you're doing, I mean, uh, you said you worked with ammunition you could be blown up yeah. even when under 
And so Even what? the administration staff, they're looking at contracting it out. Okay, and that... Uh, it's under the disguise of saving money. Right. They, uh, <coughs> what they'll do is bring a contract in, pay them so much. The contractor and that's happening in Goose Bay right now, Labrador, the whole base is being contracted out. They're competing for their own jobs right now, mm -hmm. and a clerical worker who was making 11, 12 bucks is being offered 6 or $7 wow. an hour, and they have no choice. It's the only place to work in Goose Bay. Okay. We have to take a break. This uh, Actually, if, if anybody picks up the Atlantic Monthly this month, the cover story is on the American CIA and how they made decisions like this, and it led to a, a real dumbing down of intelligence. Anyway, we'll have to take a two-minute break, and we'll be right back. <laughs> Red Oak Ford made a special purchase of Ford Supercats, and I'm here to give you the best price, $179 a month. That's right, $179 a month on a Ford Supercat. Come in to Red Oak Ford and get the best truck at the best price. Right, Remy? Right. Have we got news for you. Every day, something happens that has meaning for our readers. Stories that deserve more than a minute on the news. We cover the stories that matter the most, in depth. News that matters and topics you care about, like sports, life and the arts, local news, editorials, and the TV Times. And if you call this number right now, you can get the Times Colonist for two weeks free. Free for two weeks. Just call 1-800-663-6384 and get the news you care about. Thank you for calling the Times Colonist. How may I help you? Call 1-800-663-6384. We cover the local stories that matter most to you. The Times Colonist. We don't just cover the news, we deliver it. It could be the breathtaking beach, or the elegant dining, or maybe the cozy log cottages. In any case, discover the difference at Tynamara Resort Hotel in Parksville. The romance, the pampering, the luxury in nature you owe yourself. Your weekend getaway at Tynamara is affordably priced. Tynamara Resort Hotel in Parksville on Vancouver Island. Call toll-free 1-800-663-7373 and discover the difference. A whole shipload of wind stars arrived early from Ford. We don't have the room. You can have one for $348 a month with nothing down. That's right, $348 a month and nothing down, but only at Glen Oak Ford. And we're talking about military pay and the hearings that have gone on. I don't know about you, but I'm learning a lot. It's, it's not good so far. And let's talk to Anne in Victoria. Hi, Anne. Hi there, Judy. Thank you for covering this. Yeah, you're um, and also, don't be afraid to be bitter. This is where it's going to start. Um, I just have something to say. Being a member um, of the military, or actually a spouse of a military member mm -hmm. for several years now, um, we don't take uh, anything seriously, uh, rumor-wise, when it comes to wage increases, unless we actually see it in our bank account which nothing really significant has happened, by the way, in several years. Right. Um, I have two questions. One being, um, what exactly was that pay adjustment, quote-unquote, um, that happened just before Christmas? What is the government exactly, how does, how does the government define that? Okay. And secondly, um, they are always talking about this back pay to April of last year, or back pay of April the year before. Right. By the time they get around to um, actually figuring this out, they're really not going to be doing this back pay thing at all, are they? Okay, well, those are two questions that are pretty specific. Anyone, uh, do you know what you're no, talking about? No, I can't about? address the specifics of it, but I did hear one of the young uh, ladies in that clip explain how at the end of the various adjustments and pay raises, you know, point one of one per point nine of one percent imagine. So it really didn't have uh, any impact. Do you want to comment to me? Yeah, um, the civilians right now, okay, are the unions are in negotiations. They've been in negotiations since March. The offer that's on the table from Treasury Board now is 1% and 1% for oh, wow. the next two years. Okay, so We haven't had a raise 
for in the last seven years we've had one three percent raise. It does sound to me like they're just trying to get rid of you. Yes. I mean, that, if if you want to get rid of a union, that's how you would do it. That's why yeah, they give us a bios them. package or say take a bio right. package. You're going to be looked after. Right. Don't worry about it. But you get out, you can't draw your pension. The money goes fast. And in Victoria or this area, like most of Canada, there's no other jobs. Depending on your training. Yeah. yeah. Right. Judy, you should also mention you can't run this navy unless you have that dockyard to support them. Okay. Okay, I see that we don't quite have enough time for another call. There's a couple of things I want to ask you about. The brain drain idea, the, the idea that people are getting their training out of the military, uh, they're trying to contribute and they can't make it go, and they have to leave and do something else. Any comments on that? 25% of the folks leaving the military because there isn't enough money to support their family. My opinion is those who have options, the educated, the in-demand in industry, and there are a lot of them, sure. are voting with their feet and walking. And they are also, unfortunately, the natural leaders. That says bad things about the future of the forest downstream. Okay, because the leaders are, yeah. are, are having to leave. Yeah. Under 25 and over 55, we don't have them anymore. That's civilian military. Wow. They, there's just no reason to be there for young people because there's people no job security. Yeah. And the people over 55 are taking the bio packages yeah. because it makes sense for them. Okay, and we're out of time, and I want to thank you all, and we'll certainly follow up on this in the future. Okay, and we'll be back after a quick break. Just one taste at Country Style. It's a great day. How about some coffee and hot chocolate to warm you up? It's Country Style's Just One Taste the Winter Fun Contest. Wow! Collect to win a Toshiba Home Theater or Napoleon Woodstow or drive away in a Honda CRV. Just turn up the lip on a Country Style Game Cup to win instant prizes and much, much more. <laughs> That's all it takes it's a great day. <laughs> Every two hours, another person in BC dies from smoking. Most of them started as kids. In fact, 85% of smokers start before their 16th birthday, and half of them eventually die from it. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. The tobacco industry must stop targeting children to break the cycle of ashes to ashes. The BC Ministry of Health. In life, there are all kinds of costs that come into the picture. But that doesn't mean they should cost you your RRSP contribution. So at Van City, we've created a simple solution called the Prime Minus One RRSP Loan. Available at a remarkably low rate to help keep life from getting in the way of your RRSP. Call us today. We know you've got a lot of good reasons to protect your future. Van City, it's right here. Start your workday with 98 minutes of music commercial free. The Ocean FM 98.5. Because you love me. I only want to be with you. Victoria's at work choice, The Ocean. Listen. Coming up tomorrow, we'll be talking to the grandson of Mahatma Gandhi, and our apologies for having spelt that wrong up to now. It's spelt correctly today. Corporate schools and public funding, family service cutbacks, and the controversy with the BCMA doctors are all coming up this week. And tomorrow, as I say, we're talking to Gandhi's grandson. If you would like to send in questions, you can fax them to 250-389-1226, and we'll try to incorporate that into the direction of the interview. Now today, I have to admit, I learned a lot about what's going on in our military, and it's not good. First of all, I think it's a lunacy to contract out the military. Why don't we just hire an army of mercenaries? Even for the civilians, we heard today, many of them are working with, with ammunition. It can be very dangerous. Secondly, if we're going to have a military, they have to be properly funded. Otherwise, why don't we just be honest about it and tell them we don't want a military? So at least we're being upfront and they can go and do something else with their lives. I think that we need to address this. Canada still has international obligations we're living up to every day, and people should be properly compensated. I'm Judy Taibji, and that's my opinion at the end of the show, and we'll see you tomorrow. Good.